Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Laura Johnson with UVM Extension, and um, today we are hosting in partnership with the Vermont Vegetable and Berry Growers Association a webinar about habitat plantings to attract insect pollinators and insects that attack pests. And if anybody needs a pesticide applicator credit, please put your first and last name in the chat along with a contact email, your pesticide applicator ID number and the state you're in. Um, or you can email that to me and my email is at, on, on the slide here and I'll show this at the end as well. And um, we're going to start um, with Dr. Um, Cheryl Frank Sullivan from um, the UVM Entomology Research Lab and then move to Kyle Doda at 1000 Stone Farm. Next week, we have storage crops, what's storing well and what isn't. Um, if you wanna put that on your calendar, same time, Wednesday, 12 to one. Great, well, thank you so much for having me here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk. Um, I'm a assistant research professor at the UVM Entomology Research Lab, and projects at our lab focus on integrated pest management. And a lot of that has been researching strategies that promote the biocontrol of pests um, under protected culture. So some of this has been focused on creating habitat plantings to support beneficial insects. And okay. So just a quick reminder that beneficial insects provide valuable services such as pest management or pollination. And in general, they're broken down into three categories. You have predators which attack and eat their prey, parasites and parasitoids that lay eggs either on or within a host and pollinators, which are anything that disturbs or visits a flower. So some of these species serve multiple functions and are pest fighting pollinators. So it's really good to be able to recognize your friends from your foes if you wanna protect them. Okay, so many things are threatening the health of our insect beneficials. You have things like pests and diseases, exotic invasive species, pesticides, pollution, climate change, and habitat loss is one of the big ones in the mix. So one thing that we can do is to restore that lost habitat and provide these new areas for foraging and reproduction. So providing habitat in the form of flowering plants will attract and support um, a lot of beneficials. So you wanna leave things like these buffer or idle areas between forest field edges and hedgerows that they use for foraging and nesting. And some of these species need leaf litter in which to hibernate over the winters and others use them as hiding places to mate and reproduce. So you wanna have some places with these leftover debris so it helps them complete their life cycle. And you can also provide habitat in or around production areas. And if you do use pesticides um, on crops, it's really, um, you should do that really wisely and avoid spraying them in these prime foraging areas. And you really always want to read the label if you're going to use them. So for the past several years, we've been evaluating the effectiveness of habitat hedges using annual plants to attract beneficials to commercial growing areas um, with the intent to support pollination. But primarily we're interested in the biological control of common greenhouse and high tunnel pests. There's a lot of choices out there about what to use, um, but these are some of the choices that we made and that was based off previous research. And we use things like zinnias, sunflower, um, marigold, uh, coreopsis, cosmos, sweet alyssum, uh, cornflower, uh, purple top vervain. And these are just a few of the ones that we selected. And when establishing these plantings, there's some important things to um, make note of. And that one of those things is considering the bloom period of the plants. So these plantings ideally should provide a continuous supply of floral resources from spring to fall. However, the ones on this slide have more of a uh, summer through fall bloom period. Um, Color is also really important because many attractive plants are in shades of blue and yellow, but other colors are attractive too, like reds and whites. And these plantings should provide a diversity of uh, height and flower sizes because a lot of species have certain preferences for um, certain flowers and heights. Um, for example, many parasitic wasps really like to forage on small blossoms, but then again, it really just depends um, 
on how much time and space that you have and what beneficial insects that you want to attract. And um, it also depends on if you wanna choose native versus non-native plant species. And here are some examples of these plantings in high tunnels and in the field. And here's um, a few more examples of these habitat strips in a few various locations. So what exactly did we see visiting these? It wasn't really too surprising to us that bees, wasps, and flies um, were the most common visitors. There is also a diversity of bugs, both predatory and non-predatory, that showed up. And then there's things like thrips that fell into the other category. And a word of caution on using habitat plantings is it's really good to check your plantings just to be sure that they're not acting too much as a source of pests uh, to the farm. So it's really good to kind of inspect them once in a while just, just to be sure, because you might want to, you know, make sure it doesn't happen. So of the Hymenoptera order, which are bees and wasps and ants, um, bees comprise the majority. Then we had a lot of wasps and we broke those down by size as either large wasps and small wasps. A lot of these hornets and yellow jackets are predators of caterpillars and beetle larvae. And many of the small wasps that are found are very important parasites, especially for aphids. And these parasites create uh, aphid mummies that you see on leaf undersides. And these contain the developing wasp immatures. So essentially these small wasps fly around and sting aphids and lay eggs in them. And they create these really beautiful uh, mummies. Of the flies, the majority were cirphids. And those are really important pollinators. And a lot of these species provide pest management by predating on aphids and other small pests. There's also a lot of other flies that aren't necessarily pest predators. Um, that we were interested in. And to a lesser extent, we saw tachinids, and those are parasites of beetle larvae and caterpillars. And tachinid flies are these mostly nondescript black or grayish flies. And they can be mistaken for house flies oftentimes, but in general, they tend to be really, really hairy. So one well-known example is the winsome fly, and this is an important tachinid that's native to Japan. And in the early 1920s, they released them into the wild to combat Japanese beetles, and then they became established. So you can see these small white eggs um, that they lay on their hosts, and that's pretty distinctive to see, and they often lay them on the tops of their hosts. So after the larva hatch, they penetrate into the host to develop within. So this slide shows the many examples of hoverfly species that we commonly see in Vermont. And note that the stars indicate that the larvae are predators of small pests because a lot of these, their immatures actually feed on dead and decaying matter. So what's fun about these is they actually hover over, fl over flowers. That's kind of how they got the name hoverflies. Um, but they have that unique adaptation where they mim mimic themselves to look like bees, wasps, or hornets, or, you know, bumblebees, um, so they can evade um, predation. So that's really cool. And they do a really good job of mimicking those. And some of these on here, like the bald face hornet fly, and that's kind of the top, second to the top, <laughs> to the left. <laughs> it kind of looks just like a bald face hornet. Um, and then the orange legged uh drone fly. Where is that one? Oh, is that? it's on there somewhere. Um, but they just, they, it's just amazing because they just look so much like bees, like the Eastern hornet fly, the one that's kind of in the middle. I mean, geez, I, I would have totally thought that that was a hornet if it was kind of hovering around me. Um, but yeah, so really cool. Lots of diversity. And we want to promote them. So within these habitat plantings, we found that the plants that were most attractive to the insects were the sunflowers, zinnias, alyssum, and the cosmos. And here's just some pictures of some seraphid flies and bees on zinnias and the fire wheel. Beautiful. It's a lot of those reds and those vibrant yellows. Because remember, a lot of pollinators, they really like yellows, blues, and, and reds in those shades. And here's those beautiful yellow sunflowers and they're attracting things like the bees and the pale green assassin bug. That's another one that showed up. 
a really good predator. And it's kind of hard to see, but I'm going to talk about this one later. But there's an aureus. That's that's a pirate bug. And here's a blue corn flower. It's a beautiful flower. I actually really like that one. Oh, and the purple top vervain. You know, those those shades of blues that are really attractive. Um, of course, that hoverfly, that syrup fly that's in the picture on the far right with a purple vervain, that's a, that's the drone fly. That one actually, the larva eats algae. That's actually not a one that's a predator. And here's some beautiful visitors on some Coreopsis and Cosmos, you know, wasps and bees. And there's the pirate bug again. They have that checkerboard pattern on, on their back. Okay, so Alyssum. Alyssum has shown great promise as an insectary habitat plant in a variety of ecosystems um, to from lettuce fields out in the west to high tunnel production in the east. And alyssum, along with marigolds and ornamental peppers, have been extensively tested in greenhouse ornamental production to sustain a lot of commercially reared natural enemies. So a lot of the parasitic wasps that are per purchased for aphid control need floral resources in order to maximize their egg laying. So a lot of predatory mites also eat pollen in the absence of prey. So they can be used to sustain them as well. So then you have these predatory bugs that I mentioned earlier called aureus. Um, they're also naturally occurring, but you can also purchase them commercially. And they really need these floral resources, especially early on in the season, because with aureus, they're subject to seasonal diapause, which is like a hibernation state. So they're really only useful late spring through fall. And using these habitat plants are one way to really get their establishment going. And then here are some examples of, you know, various habitat plants in high tunnel um, production. So at one time, we established these plantings of borage, alyssum, dill, and marigolds in summer high tunnel crops to see if they would attract or to see what they would attract into the tunnels. And alyssum uh, was the most attractive, surprise, surprise. It also bloomed the longest and was really easy to maintain. And it really wasn't as invasive as borage. So borage actually self-sowed a lot and was really attractive to pests. So we really don't recommend that that be used as a habitat plant in high tunnels um, just for that very reason. And they're just, they just grew huge and they're just kind of, they were kind of an ungrateful plant and they kind of broke and they'd fall over and then they would rot and then they'd get earwigs and they'd get aphids and sometimes spider mites. So that's what you really don't want to have happen in a habitat plant. So on these plantings, what we found, um, we found a lot of good stuff that we really like to see. Like they started harboring numerous parasitic wasps and then they had um, a lot of cirphids were attracted. attracted, And of course the um, pirate bug aureus was also something that started to be sustained in higher numbers on these. So our newest project that we're working on uh, is a NRCS funded project for the next couple years. And it's looking at alyssum strips planted in the unused space between high tunnels. And one of the criticisms of planting alyssum inside tunnels is that loss of productive growing space. And still, it's really unclear about what rate that they should be planted inside tunnels to really maximize on um, pest management. That's something that we've been um, trying to find funding to look at. Um, and that's something that we hope to, to look at in the future because um, that's still kind of like an outstanding question. But by establishing the strips outside, there's really no loss of productive growing space within the tunnels. So what we're gonna be doing is collecting data on the beneficial visitors uh, to the strips as well as on the crops within the tunnels. Um, and we're gonna be testing that against tunnels that obviously don't have any strips planted outside. So we're particularly interested in that summer fall turnover period um, because you really wanna see um, what syrphid flies and other natural enemies they're attracting to combat aphids, especially moving into that winter greens period because that fall is that really important time to be honing in on aphid management. So hopefully these will be attracting things, they'll be there. So whatever's outside can actually help them go into, you know attack any of those early season aphids that might otherwise overwinter over, you know, the winter season. And I did start a web page for that project. Um, it's that link that's there, but we're not going to look at that until this spring. So there's not much on there right now.
So before I switch over to Kyle, I just wanted to mention that there's a plethora of information out there about plant selections to attract beneficials. And at the end of this presentation, there's a slide that has several resources from NRCS, ZRC Society, and a whole lot of other places with annuals, perennials, natives, non-natives, and other ones that are kind of tested and kind of true um, for use to attract beneficial insects. So we'll make sure that that slide is available as like a PDF or something for, for any future reference. Um, and that's all I have for um, part one. Now it's on to Kyle. We can get into it. I, hi everyone, I'm Kyle Doda and I run and uh, own a Thousand Stone Farm in Brookville, Vermont with my partner, Betsy. Um, we run a uh, very diversified vegetable, uh, mushroom, fruit farm now. Um, and so um, we've kind of branched out and done a bunch of different stuff, but um, we're cultivating around five acres. Um, we do about three quarters of an acre in high tunnel production as well. Um, and so I guess one of the things that we um, started to do was um, in one of our um, high tunnel um, proposals with NRCS, we proposed to put in um, pollinator habitat and using one of their programs uh, for EQIP. And so um, that kind of got us started on, um, I guess, where we are now, or moving hopefully moving towards, um, and uh, I guess predominantly trying to um, not always fight against everything um, that we're doing in farming and making, um, just seems like sometimes you're banging your head against the wall, um, trying to either spray or use a lot of mechanical barrier, which can be both costly um, and time consuming. Um, and, you know, as well as, um, not always uh, very successful, um, unfortunately. So um, kind of trying to move away from that um, to what degree we can. Um, and part of that was to start planting um, beneficial and pollinator habitat on a bit of a larger scale for our farm. So um, we do have um, a mixed um field space of arable crops and non-arable crops. And so we have um, fruit trees interplanted with uh, some of our um, vegetable fields as well as um, in neighboring hillside um, pasture. And so we're kind of looking for a number of things um, between um, pollinators as well as for beneficials for our crops. Um, this, I'm still pretty new to this. Um, I'm probably not going to get all the terminology right here, but uh, Cheryl and Laura will help out. Um, and, uh, you know, we're still doing our own research on seeing how this works for us and how it's, um, how it develops over time. So, so we, um, we're a certified organic farm. And one of the things that I kind of noticed in the beginning was NRCS um, is great and uh, um, definitely trying to kind of move in a direction in which they are understanding how to work with smaller farms that are highly diversified. Um, you know, some of the techniques that were suggested for um, starting or establishing pollinator habitat was um, to spray glyphosate to, um, to kill the weeds um, and uh, the sod. So we, you know, as an organic farm and, um, is something not comfortable doing. Um, we weren't doing that, so we were using repeated tillage, um, and in in general, like even as you can see in this photo, um, there is um, there is some of the pollinator habitat, but there's also weeds and grasses, and and I think you know overall for us um, that works. You know, I don't mind it's not going to be this perfect sort of manicured flower garden. Um, and I think kind of 
for me, getting over that or understanding that is um, is important. So in this photo, you can kind of see like to the left is uh, sweet corn and to the right is um, plum trees. And then interplanted here, there's about a uh, 20 foot um, section. So it's 10 feet on either side of the, the tree planting that has um, this, this pollinator planting. Um, and so um, we can kind of skip to the next here. There's another photo. Um, these are peaches with the same exact thing uh, on the opposite side of that field, actually, from that year. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that, if you go to this next photo, one of the things that we, that I've, I'm trying to do is, you know, a decent amount of the, the plant species are annuals, not all of them, but a, a lot of them. And so trying to see if I can allow as many of them to go to seed as possible um, so that we can try to be reseeding them without having to keep buying seed every year. Um, I think, you know, a little bit of input maybe every couple of years is important, especially for certain ones um, that you might want more of, like sweet alyssum, or like I know that I'm going to plant um, more sweet alyssum um, and try to increase that population next to our high tunnels. Um, but so just trying to think about, you know, whether it's like, like we did a lot of buckwheat, clover, sweet clover, white, red, um, cilia, um, sweet alyssum, and then all of our fruit trees have um, comfrey, uh, sterile comfrey plants. Uh, I highly recommend you get sterile comfrey um, planted next to them as well. Um, and that's a dual purpose. So it also adds fertility um, as well as the use for compost teas, but um, and pollinator as well. So, um, but yeah, trying to let some of these go to seed um, was is a goal and we'll find out this year if that actually how much comes up and whether they can out compete the situation that they're in um, the next slide shows kind of us prepping between our greenhouses um, and so um, using like a field perfecto cultivator um, with a roller on the back um, to you know every couple of weeks after rain let it germinate come back let it germinate um, so we did that for basically most of the season um, and it did seem to work pretty well. I mean, grasses are going to be where they are um, in the strip here in the middle is mulched uh, planting for um, elderberries and herbs um, as well. Um, and so this is what the sweet clover and mix looked like. Uh, the seeding got a little heavy in the front uh, of the greenhouses. and so. Uh, there's a lot of sweet clover there, but um, it really, uh, sweet clover produces an amazing amount of organic matter as well as um, the bloom season is extremely long. I think it's like, I don't know, May to September or something like that. It can be very long, maybe June to September. Um, and it just keeps going. Um, so hopefully we can recreate this even at a 50% um, for the next year because it's a lot of habitat for pollinators. And the next slide shows the same thing, but in the tree lanes in the field. And so in the fall of the previous year, um, doing that tillage, there's mulch in between uh, where the trees are. And then um, also um, herbs in between each of the trees as well. I think there's a better photo of that. Maybe, maybe not. Um, here's another picture. There was like some... Uh, as it says here, some issues of the sweet clover getting a little too much for around the fruit trees. And um, so we needed to do a high mow on some of that and um, and get that kind of under control because they were creating some, they were laying down basically and creating some issues around some of the younger fruit trees. Um, but it, that would be easily remedied for the future. Some more pictures after mowing. Um, a lot of clovers coming back up and even um, some of the other species as well. This picture is showing um, in between all of the, um, the tree lanes, there is um, 
different herbs. So here's some flowering thyme, and there's the comfrey as well next to the sweet clover. Plenty of grasses. Um, you know, we will go through and like do some minor hand weeding around the trees, um, but we're not, you know, spending a ton of time. We are remulching each um, year, and so that does help to kind of build that up and and suppress some of that as well. So, yeah, I will say, you know, one of the things that um, to think about is if you are going to plant herbs like this, um, you know, what what pests, as Cheryl was saying, you may not want on them. You may want, um, it's just things to balance and think about. Um, you know, uh, I know in the past we've had, we had some overwintering herbs and greenhouses and they definitely harbored some thrips for us at a period of time. I think it was actually when Cheryl first came out to the farm years ago, but, um, and then, you know, another thing to think about would be like chives as an example. Um, you know, you, they're obviously an allium family. And so if you're also having a lot of allium production in your fields, um, it's just something to consider. You might be harboring overwintering pests, um, or attracting them earlier or later, or they could also be a trap for pests and then you could utilize that. Um, so it can kind of, there's multiple ways to think about it, I think. Flowering comfrey, um, we got um, root clippings for that. And so you want to, if you are planting comfrey, uh, you definitely want to get the sterile bridles so the flowers don't um, spread even more uh, at all. Um, and so the only way that this comfrey will spread is by tillage. So you want to make sure you're planting it in a place where you're not going to till and then ideally you're good to go. Um, it is really great. It brings up a lot of nutrients. Um, and so when you chop them down at the end of the year, or if you want to mix them into your compost, um, we make a lot of on-farm compost. And so that's part of our program. Um, but, you know, we have 200 or more of these um, plants now in the field next to each um, fruit tree. Um, and I should say that these tree lanes are 200 feet long. Our fields are all standardized to 200 feet long. So um, just to give you a feel of the scale. This is also with um, dwarf cherries here next to it um, in this picture on the right. Okay, this is where I'm going to jump in. I have so many questions yeah. for you, Kyle. After I just <laughs> wanted to highlight. Um, so I went out to Kyle's farm. This is Laura from UVM. Um, and um, for over a couple of seasons, and when I go out to farms, I try to do a monitoring exercise that is just about 10 minutes and whatever's blooming and I use this uh, monitoring sheet and I just wanted to highlight here what in 10 minutes what I saw in that yellow sweet clover that we just saw some pictures of and the what I'm looking for is pretty um, it's uh, honeybees bumblebees other bees are wasps. Sometimes I'm not able to distinguish between the two. Uh, flies, moths or butterflies and beetles. And those are the categories that I'm looking for. And in 10 minutes, there was, you know, more honeybees than I could count. And overall, there was almost a hundred um, of, of all of these types of insects that I was looking for, um, just walking one of those uh, yellow sweet clover strips. So it was pretty incredible to just see that of diversity. And then I just stuck some photos in the PowerPoint here of some, these are two mining bee species and which are really important bee species, which are really important for fruit pollination and spring um, pollination and crops. Uh, and then I saw several types of bumblebees in just looking at this uh, sweet clover stand specifically. And there's just two species that are shown here. Other pollinators, beetles, a honeybee, a monarch. So just some examples of uh, what was in and around the habitat strips that Kyle had. But as everybody's been saying today, it's not all rainbows and birthday cake. There's of course some pests that may be in the strips and to um, keep an eye out for. Um, so I'm gonna, 
I just wanted to ask you, Kyle, I'm going to go back a little bit to um, your, this mowing slide. How did you, what equipment did you use to mow the cover crop um, yeah. on um, these strips? So we have a, I guess, whatever slide, um, we have a um, tractor mounted um, PTO driven um, five foot um, flail mower, uh, Del More. Um, well, mower, I think I got it through Champlain Valley Equipment at some point. Um, they're made in Italy. Um, it's great. Uh, I use it for a number of things. Um, if you haven't used a plow mower, they really do an awesome job, way better than um, a brush hog for many of the purposes that we use them for. Um, and so it's, the, if you're not familiar, plow mower is kind of like a rototiller. It's it's spinning blades in a, around a cylinder. And so it really can almost chop stuff up like, like hay shredded straw um which is really nice um and i also i guess my my theory i should say is that when you're when i'm trying to utilize the seed that is currently existing on the plants um and i'm able to like ideally hopefully enough of that seed drops to the ground as i'm mowing um and is then kind of covered by the plant material so that it's protected and able to ideally get decent soil contact um, is the hope. Um, and then we have a walk behind BCS flail mower um, as well, which is helpful, especially like along the greenhouse edges um, like and things of that nature. You mean in this scenario? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and like in that picture, um, the edges of the greenhouse it's kind of hard to get up next to with the tractor comfortably, I suppose. I mean, it can be done. Um, the middle, obviously, we would mow with the tractor, but then it, I do like to go around on the edge of the greenhouse with uh, the BCS well mower. Another question I had for you is, how did you go about choosing to use um, yellow sweet clover in in this planting scenario and then in the um, I think the NRCS funded, or maybe it was all NRCS funded, I'm not sure, there was a, a mix. How did you distinguish which you wanted to use where? Yeah, um, so the I think mostly just by my own research and, and just kind of like nitrogen fixation, the, some of the added benefits besides just the fact, you know, the, the fact that it is attracting pollinators and beneficials. Um, and trying to have, you know, I think it's great. Obviously, some things are really good for, for one thing, um, but it's really nice when you're planting something like, you know, comfrey or the, the um, clovers that you're getting kind of more than one um, benefit from them, you know, which is obviously you get more than one benefit, but like insects, uh, biomass, and, you know, say nitrogen fixation. Um, as well. If that answers that. Yeah. Did you find um, establishing any of these strips challenging or pretty straightforward, or how did that go for you? I think that establishing them the first year is relatively um, straightforward, so to speak. Um, you know, I used a nursery crop of oats. Um, and so basically um, seeding down um, your common oats um, and allowing them to kind of like grow up to a certain, maybe like six inches or so. Um, and then you can either, you could broadcast with that the rest of your mix, or you can broadcast it a little afterwards. Um, it just allows for the dew in the morning to stay a little um, longer and a little bit of um, shading from that as well, um, I think helps germination of the rest of the crops. There is a question in the chat that says, um, oh, I guess this is to me. How often do you recommend an insect or pollinator monitoring assessment? That's a good question. 
Um, and I don't know if I have a good answer for you, but because <laughs> generally my my approach has been to with this monitoring exercise familiarize myself with what's going on in the landscape at that moment in time. And I think what would be an interesting or important to consider is understanding, like if you're thinking about a particular pollinator that, or uh, yeah, particular pollinator or pest that you want to attract for a particular crop, doing the monitoring exercise of your strip um, to see if it is attracting that particular pollinator or pest that you don't want that is going to impact your crop. So um, so that is like one suggestion in terms of timing. And um, in blueberries, for example, something that we've been doing is prior to blueberry bloom, uh, assessing habitat plantings prior to bloom to see what species are in willows, for example, which bloom prior to blueberries, pussy willow. And then once blueberries and bloom, are we also seeing that in the crop? So just trying to gain some understanding about whether or not that habitat strip is benefiting in the way that you're hoping it to. Um, and the same would be for for I think pests, but I, I welcome Cheryl's input on that as well in terms of scouting and monitoring um, as a, a pest expert, which I am not. Yeah, so that's, thank you for that question. Yeah, I mean, I'll chime in on that. I mean, it really comes down to what your own personal objective is. I mean, if you're looking at like an insect monitoring or scouting program, for ag crops or tunnel crops. I mean, that should be done on a regular basis, like weekly or every two weeks, because these things change over time. And, you know, the complex of pests and beneficials, you know, there's different species that occur at different times of the year on different crops. And once you start doing this on a regular basis and keeping records of when these things occur, that's when you can start tailoring things to your own farm production, because you're able to anticipate what's going to be there and maximize on what's coming, what it could manage, and so on and so forth. So I think it just depends on, you know, how much time you have too, because that's, that's the biggest problem is time. And if you're not out there looking for things, and then there's a problem, then, you know, you might have missed the opportune, you no know, time to manage that. Thank you. Anyway. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Kyle, there's a question for you in the chat. It says, um, yep. thank you. Very fascinating. Did you say you planted the first round of yellow sweet clover in 2022? I'm wondering if you've been doing it long enough to see, see how mowing them and letting them reseed is working for you. Yes and no. Uh, yes, we planted them in 2022. Um, sweet clover is a biannual. Um, if I'm understanding my yes. knowledge correctly. Um, and so um, the first year it kind of grows up um, and doesn't really flower and then um, and establishes its roots. And then the second year you have a, a large um, bloom like you're seeing in the photos. Um, and so it's still the same concept of whether it's going to recede well enough is the question, or if I have to seed more. Um, and I won't know that answer in for a couple more months, um, technically. So when did you establish them in 2022? Uh, in the I believe it was, yeah, in the fall, like after tillage and then like kind of early fall-ish as the rain, as we started to get some rainier days, um, getting them seeded down. One question I have, about these pollinator questions is in terms of expense, um, does, did it feel doable? Was it really essential to have that support from NRCS to, to get it done? Or um, yeah, just thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, the 
the NRCS funding definitely doesn't cover your time, um, but it covers the seed costs. And so some of these seeds can definitely add up when you start to, um, you know, do a larger area, so to speak. But, you know, you might be investing, like, I think it was like $500 that I invested. It, you know, it wasn't astronomical. Um, we'll see if that's every single year I'm doing that or if it's just, you know, once every couple of years. Um, I think either way, I, if, even if it was every year, I mean, um, when you run the numbers, if you're, if let's say, I mean, besides maybe like for us, I would say potato beetles would be like, and maybe like, there's a couple of pests that might not, you know, go away below the threshold, so to speak. But, um, you know, if I'm not out spraying it until dark, uh, multiple times a year or this or that, um, never mind the cost of the organic um, pesticides, uh, it's well, it's well worth it, um, I think, financially. Um, and also, you know, I, it just makes me feel better about what I'm doing, I guess, at the end of the day. Um, so there is that as well. And it is beautiful. Um, so there's a lot to be said for all those things. It's not always about the end. Um, end dollar but um i do think that it makes it, it has a very strong possibility um if not pretty certain that it makes things better overall in the long term if it's something that i stick with so do you expect to to continue doing this in oh yeah the next, yeah 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 definitely um yeah and i think you know it'll only get better and you kind of like dial it in um as you go, I mean, one of the things that I was thinking about with Cheryl's um, discussion about, you know, we net some of our greenhouses for, um, uh, as an example, for cucumber production and for some of our eggplants uh, to, to for potato beetles. Um, and so, um, you know, that planting sweet alyssum outside of that or things of that nature wouldn't, depending on the, the beneficial or the pest, wouldn't necessarily because of the mesh in the greenhouse walls. Um, however, um, you know, you think about when you see um, like kind of the troughs that are used in uh, in uh, hydroponic production, if you were to do hanging troughs like either above um, in the canopy, uh, up, up higher uh, in the greenhouses, somewhere where you're not actually taking up soil space, um, and you, you know, whether you put those, you know, on drip on an automatic, and so you just have this 100 foot row of sweet alyssum just hanging above your head, um, it kind of could work really well. And so I was just trying to think about because we don't actually have any um, beneficial plantings inside greenhouses. I used to do that, and I kind of lost track of that for a little bit. So I, I could see how um, I might want to jump back into that. So. Um, some of this. But I mean, this year I bought five more pounds of sweet alyssum um, because I do want to increase that in general. So um, if that means just seeding a little more here and there and, and clusters or pots and planting them out or whatever that is, then then we'll do that. I just had a quick question, uh, comment. Kyle, this is awesome. Um, it's great to see all these plantings and hearing about how you're implementing them. I think a lot of people are looking to use them. Um, I, I was curious, I had to step away for a moment when I was, I missed kind of all of the different types of beneficial uh, plantings that you've been using. But one thing that we kind of anecdotally and incidentally experienced as a really great uh, plant for recruiting beneficial insects has been buckwheat. Um, mm -hmm. So it's been really successful. Like we actually did a planting where we're using it as a buffer between some of our plots for Colorado potato beetle study. And we had essentially no Colorado potato beetle pressure. Um, from these planting. I mean, it was a ton. It was like every other plot was buckwheat. <laughs> and we just saw a, a huge increase in a lot of the beneficial insects that feed upon the larvae, um, especially predatory stink bugs. Um, and then we had another, um, we worked, we had a farm partnership grant with a farmer down um, near Northfield that was working, that primarily grew uh, Brussels sprouts. And had a huge outbreak of cabbage aphids and just happened to plant um, some buckwheat in a whole field next door. And the the predatory larva of the um, hoverflies completely clean, picked it clean. 
And so I, I'm all in on, on Buckwheat to, to say this. The only thing that we also saw, though, that we did see a little bit of, depending on the timing of the planting, we think that we saw some amount of suppression of germination um, for our potatoes, but that was for the really late planted potatoes because um, it, it was a mixed study. So anyways, I'm just curious if you've been using buckwheat or if that's something that you've been interested in. It was really great. I mean, I we haven't tested it like in a like in a scientific uh, study, but there's a ton of research behind it. And it was it was it was stark um, how little Colorado potato, be Colorado potato beetle we had in the field compared to another field at the research farm. So just yeah, that's awesome. Um, that's really great. I have planted buckwheat um, and it's it's also great because it will reseed itself really well. Um, and so in strips, that's great. I have theorized um, with our, the way that we're doing potatoes, we do a pretty small scale of potatoes, but um, so to speak, but uh, is um, kind of in between each row, our, our rows, our hills, I should say, of potatoes are like, um, uh, like maybe four feet on center or five feet on center kind of. And so um, doing that whole flat strip area and just broadcasting buckwheat over top of every, you know, that whole, the whole field, basically letting it come up, letting it grow with the, cause you're also getting that weed suppression. And so, and buckwheat is like, when you're running a digger through that, it, it doesn't matter. Like it's, it's not rooted well enough, like grass or something else to really inhibit the, um, the digging of the potatoes, um, for harvesting wise. And so I'm really excited that you said that was working really well because um, that gives me more incentive to try that idea that I've been thinking about for about five years. So um, I've had some experience um, with really dense plantings of, um, of buckwheat and it, it did really um, prove if you wait, I think that's one of the catches, like you need to wait and let things do what it's supposed to do. Like, and it, it often almost seems like it's the pest pressure is like at the peak of like where you're really uncomfortable about it, or at least I have had that experience, but then it just starts to like, then the predators come in and start to work. Um, and every time I've ever decided like, oh, I need to spray instead of waiting, they don't really die. They just kind of like get knocked back and then they come back, but I also just killed all the predators. So it's like, that's, that's why I've moved towards this. Cause I'm just like, I'm spending hundreds of dollars on spraying. It's not, I don't feel good about it. And I also like, am not seeing the results that I would like to see. Um, but uh, we had a similar situation, but there was buckwheat planted in between the rows, kind of like the same concept of three foot wide swath or maybe less two foot wide swath in between each row. Um, and it works great. We had aphids and then all of a sudden there was like all sorts of different predators coming in and taking care of it and they were gone. And that was that. And then basically, and then once they started coming and it was like a week or two more of that, I just, um, I ended up mowing the buckwheat. It made a really great mulch and we moved on with the season and it was like, great. I just cover cropped this whole field every, you know, three feet, every other, um every other bed and um yeah it was it was definitely successful so i you know it's just i think getting ourselves and colleagues to realize that there is value to that investment you know um i mean it sucks that everything's about the bottom line usually but um it is definitely there's definitely worth in in it and you sure feel a lot better about it i can admit that at least Cool. Thank, thank you. you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you both. Um, and then from a pollinator perspective, I'll just say in terms of um, buckwheat, buckwheat supplies a lot of um, yeah nectar flow when it comes to feeding bees at least and um, in the morning. So super active in the morning in that cover crop when it comes to bees and other insects feeding. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to make this one comment about the buckwheat. For those of you that may be like, oh, I don't want to have it recede. It recedes so easy. You're concerned because of like the buckwheat weed pressure. I personally, the buckwheat would be the least of my concerns. Like, I don't know. Obviously, everybody deals with different weeds, but 
we deal with some serious grass scenario with cra crabgrass stuff. And so buckwheat's like a joke. Um, it'll definitely cultivate out really easily. And like, if you miss a couple, you have some nice flowering buckwheat in the field alongside your squash or whatever it is. It's not the end of the world. Um, I just, it really isn't. Um, yeah, it, I think it would be highly minimal. But uh, next week, Wednesday, 12 to 1 p.m., we'll be talking about storage crops, what's storing well and what isn't. Uh, and then uh, tour of the pollinator support plan tool on March 6th. That'll be me again. And then on March 13th, winter projects and business shifts um, that will be game changers this, this year. So I just want to take a minute or a second just to thank Cheryl and Kyle for sharing today and for everybody who attended and asked questions and contributed to the conversation. This will be recorded or this has been recorded and will be put on the BVBGA um, YouTube channel. And um, I think I've got everybody's pesticide applicator information and um, we can close with that and thank you very much.